varieties of swindlers and boiler room operations, real estate moguls, weapons manufacturers, cults and cult victims, culty programmers, movie stars, producers, music stars, casinos. That's just what I rattle off just to, to get some feel for. Uh, now, it's been a, a great journey because, you know, these people are really fun. I mean, what, you, you can't ask for more entertainment than some of these crazy people. And, of course, uh, uh, the billionaires were terrific. I started up doing uh, work for Howard Hughes back in 1968. I, I put together his sound system that rocked the whole ninth floor there at the Desert Inn and because uh, he, he wanted to watch movies. You know, he had owned RKO and he wanted the, the local, he bought the local TV station because he wanted to see movies, but that wasn't good enough. So they put him up in the penthouse and we put this gigantic sound system in there. It was a it's voice of the theater speakers, the big speakers from, from movie theaters, and he just rocked, he rocked the chandeliers in the place. That whole story is on my website at bugsweeps.com the uh, pictures and other information uh, about the, the Howard Hughes thing, because that was one of the first billionaires. I uh, had several other billionaires. Uh, Merv, Merv was one of my billionaire clients. And uh, other uh, individuals that were um, billionaires from uh, land transactions. There are, some, there are some homes that I have been in in Bel Air with people that were executives for the oil companies where the whole interior of the of these mansions were Greek and Roman things. I mean, it was like stepping back 2,000 years. They everything was from ancient Greece and ancient Rome. It's amazing to see how some of the people live that have these fantastic fortunes. Unbelievable. And then uh, I did a lot of mafia work also in uh, Las Vegas back when the Italian mafia was running it, and when that's when Vegas was great. I mean, they took it to tables, but the food was free, and the shows were free, and the drinks were free, and everything was free, and it just was a, it was a really wild place back then. And I uh, got a chance to hang out with uh, um, Frank and some of the boys, and Elvis, and some of the other great stars of that time. And, uh, Las Vegas was, you know, I don't even, I pass through it now. I don't even stay, stay there anymore. It's just, to me, it's just a shell of what it used to be. And, uh, and also, I used to sweep um, some of the interesting things in, in, um, in, in Hollywood was that there was, a, there was a card club hidden. It was a secret card club hidden under a nightclub on Sunset Boulevard. And this is during the 1980s. And three times a month I'd go there, and it was, you know, gambling tables and all that. And three times a month I would go there and sweep this location. And then that evening, the Italian Mafia, the Black Mafia, the Cuban Mafia, the Russian Mafia, and any other guest mafias that they had would all merge on this building. And they would gamble with one another, big stakes gambling, and they would make handshake deals because all the cocaine was at that time coming in uh, from uh, the CIA into Los Angeles. And these people had this distribution network and they did everything by handshakes and suitcases of money going back and forth. And there was times where we were bodyguarding some of these people just because they were pretty, some of them were pretty looney tune. They would, you know, catalog, carried a lot of guns and a lot of people like to just shoot guns and, you know, just for fun, just go out there and unload uh, a, uh, a uh, automatic. <laughs> and a lot of them carried over 100,000 cash. I remember I had one, we were riding a limo with one Cuban uh, mafia guy and he said, I want to go to this place that has the Cuban coffee. So we're down at Southgate. And we go to this uh, Cuban coffee stand, and uh, he orders Cuban coffee for everybody. There's about four or five of us. And he takes out $100,000 out of his pocket. He had a roll this thick, $100,000. And people that were standing there went like, whoa. They'd never seen so much money. Big rubber bands, a big circular thing like that. And I said, put the money away. Put the money away. And uh, you know, we took the money out and paid for the drinks. I mean, only, <laughs> only five, six bucks for the whole thing. But you know, he's they also sent me down to, I remember one other little thing I'm going to tell you here. They sent me down to Southgate. And uh, it's a little rundown 
little dumpy place in Southgate. I can't figure out why they want me to go down there and do a bug sweep on a d dumpy little place like this, you know. So I knock on the door, and the guy that opens up is one of the, their bodyguards from uh, Columbia, and he's sitting there with a with a uh, AK-47 on his lap. And I said, well, why would the boss send me down? And he said, well, I'll just sweep the place out, check it out. Okay, so I took the, the sweep gear out, and I'm sweeping the walls and the floor with the gear that we've got to do that. And then there's a bedroom area in the back. I said, well, do you want me to sweep the bedroom? He said, yeah, go in there and sweep the bedroom. So I go in the bedroom, and here is boxes of cash, boxes and boxes of boxes of cash, all 20s and, and rubber bands, all different color rubber bands. And I, I walk back out to this guy. I said, well, how much money's in there? He said, oh, then 750, maybe a million. And I said, oh, tell you what, I'll go in there and sweep it, but you better sit right there with me because I don't want anybody to think that I did any samples, you know. <laughs> So it was, uh, it was, I was younger and stupider, and it was a lot of danger to some of it. But then again, uh, I had a lot of good times, too. I was with, uh, I was with um, um, Rock Hudson the night he died at his house. And uh, that was uh, something to see because, of course, he was one of the first famous AIDS people. And uh, I got a chance to spend a lot of time with some very big stars and some really terrific people in Hollywood. And, you know, they weren't all crazy perverts and all that. But, you know, a lot of the, the excitement is the, is the crazy gun stuff. I remember we were bodyguarding one place in Bel Air because uh, one guy, they had attempt, made an attempt on his life. And we were sitting out there in the backyard at 2 o'clock in the morning with, with, with two machine guns. And the sprinkler system went on, and we, we machine gunned all the sprinklers. <laughs> no, we thought we were being attacked. You know how sprinklers are. They all pop up every there, so we're out there. <laughs> Police came. It wasn't fun. Okay, uh, let's move on to one more privacy thing. I had mentioned that Art Bell and myself had had this headbutting session where I had listed and talked to him about things that he thought would be okay with him to allow the government to look into. And of course, keep in mind with national security letters that are part of the Patriot Act now, you don't even have warrants for these government people to come in and look at these categories of privacy uh, kinds of uh, accounts. And so, you know, we got to get rid of the Patriot Act. That's the bottom line. We've got to get rid of it. <laughs> We have to somehow get us get a court that's going to have the understanding of the founding fathers to not allow these kind of gross abuses of these bill of, bill of right amendments. But I just want to go through this list of things that you need to think about that the government can just walk with a letter and say, "Here, give me their information." So I just want to run down the list so that you can think about it and see where you're at with it. The first would be obviously bank account statements. Everybody's got a bank account. Well, security agents of Homeland Security, FBI, CIA, they can just now take a national security letter and then go into a bank and say, here, give me all his bank statements. So right there, everything that's gone through your bank, and that would include credit card purchase statements. One of the things that drives me crazy is, is uh, if you watch Law and Order, half the time when they're solving a case, the, the cop walks into the other cop, he says, well, his credit card statements are coming through the facts as we speak. And of course, a lot of times, they are using credit cards to place people at different locations in different times. Because if you're running your card, then that leaves its trail of not only what you buy, but when you bought it and at what time. Stock market and stu uh, mutual fund statements. These are where your assets are, say your saving assets are located. IRS tax filing records. There's a real road map of where your assets are, what you make, who you work for, and obviously if you're taking deductions, wh what you spend it on. Credit reporting agency information. You know, th these, these government agents could just run your credit reports, and then they get this whole litany and list of where your assets are and how you spend things and where to go give the rest of the national security letters to get the, the, the other information. Landline and cell phone telephone bills. Well, this is, this is really a problem because, you know, recently the courts have told 
everybody that complained about the NSA getting all the dialed number information, they, during this court lawsuit, came up and said, well, the dial information that the phone companies have in their records belongs to the phone company. Well, wait a second. I called people I wanted to call, and my expectation was that who I call is my business. Well, guess what? That's not the case. Courts say, oh, yeah, you want to just take that whole database of three years or so, they keep the dial numbers for about three years, and just send it to a supercomputer in NASA headquarters, and they'll do what they call data mining, where they start connecting all these phone numbers up to one another, 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 making these gigantic network of, of information. So now they know who you talk to for the past three years. Gasoline credit card statements, every place you go, within the 200 mile, 300 mile increment of buying another, another gasoline uh, tank, tank of gas. They know the timeline, they know where you were, they know approximately how much gas you had, how far you, how far you could have gone. Cell phone tracking location records, and there's been a lot of controversy about this. Now, this is the way it works. When you have a cell phone and you go from point A to point B and you switch from one tower location to another because the way the cell towers are set up, and I've got some pictures here so you can get a good, good idea how the setup works. When you go from one cell tower to the next, there's a handoff that's involved. In other words, your cell phone does a handshake going from the tower that you're linked to to the tower that you're going to link to. It says, I'm over here, and then there's an exchange of information so that when somebody calls into the system looking for you, the system knows approximately which tower to send the call through. Now, that handshake information goes into the database of the cell company. Once again, this is database information that the NSA has now full access to so they know everywhere that your cell phone has been when it's on for the past three years. How does that make you feel? Easy pass statements. In other words, when you use the easy pass, that's the microwave RFID that's in your automobile so that when you go on those parts of the freeway, they know how to charge you for your uh, use of that freeway, whatever the rate is. But that doesn't mean that, that those reader systems aren't working in other places because once the RFID is in the window, any RFID reader that's near the freeway will read your presence. So a lot of people have gotten into trouble for that. They said, oh, I wasn't there. But then the RFID system says, yeah, you were. You got a charge during that time, and that's another tracking. Medical records. Well, this is the big push with these people. Let's get all the medical records on database. That's what we're hearing right now, though. We're working real hard on it. The uh, Obama administration wants everybody's medical records on, uh, on databases now. Well, you can see where that's going. Databases mean that you can move the huge amount of information around, and next thing you know, the NSA is going to say, you know what? Here's a national security letter for that person. Send me over all the data. I want to know all about their health condition. Databases are scary because, you know, as these microchips and as these ba databases get more powerful and more powerful, your privacy gets smaller and smaller. It's an, it's an inverse function. The more powerful the, the processing processing chip and the processing systems, the smaller your privacy. Criminal records. Oh, one more thing on the medical records. A sample of your DNA. A sample of your DNA. You get arrested in California, they take a sample of your DNA. That means that you're in that database for whatever use that they plan. You're at birth now. At birth, is that right? Well, wouldn't surprise me. Well, wouldn't surprise me. Okay, uh, criminal records, arrest records. Military records, driver's license records, satellite surveillance. Now, these satellite surveillance systems that they have can go back and look at what's happened for the past couple of weeks. 
So if there was one of their surveillance satellites traveling in your general area, they would be able to go back and see not only what's visible on the ground, but these satellites have radar in them. They are able to look through the roofs and they're able to see who, what bodies are in what locations. This originally was settled because they were flying aircraft around looking for people growing marijuana in the inside of the homes. 